Aloha, I'm Reverend Tim Lytle, Senior Minister here at Unity Church of Hawaii in Honolulu. And we are so grateful for all of you who watch us on our YouTube channel. We know with you that as you view these teachings and apply them to your lives, that it helps to build your life into the very best one that can be imagined. If you're ever in the area, please come and join us for a service, and please enjoy the message that you're about to watch. Aloha. As I promised earlier, we have a special guest speaker today, Marianol sister, Joan Chatfield. Is it, am I correct? Okay, yes. And so please, let us give her a warm unity, uh, yeah, unity welcome. And here, uh, presenting Miss, uh, or excuse me, sister <laughs> Joan Jaffe. Thank you. We are sisters, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a challenge when you give two sermons on a Sunday, and you're new. You weren't here at nine. But the music people were here before 9 and will be here after 11. So I want to say a very, 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 very special thank you to all the musicians. <laughs> and the reason why, the reason why is because I only gave them the title of my talk. And you want to know something? If, if some um, supernatural being had wished me out of here, you know, like they used to do the money in the old supermarkets, you know, in a tube. If I had been wished out of here, you've already had the sermon. If you really listen to the words, there, there's not a single thing that you folks did that doesn't underscore. And all it was was a little telephone call and a little, yeah, the title is Gratitude and... Gratitude and gratitude and giving. And that's what I'm going to talk about. But I couldn't do that without making a very, very special affirmation of what it's like. You know, there's an old saying in, in the church world that the one who sings and plays, prays twice. That's a very, very common thing. And it's very interesting. It goes across religious denominations. It's not just the Christians who say it, and not just the Jews who say it, and not just all the other people who say it. It's everybody understands that when you sing, you, as the individual doing that, singing and praying and supporting the musical thing. So I just want to give a little extra aloha no to those folks. I didn't say this before, but I say it now, Chris. Okay. I come anytime just to hear you or on the radio. Okay, that's number one. Number two, uh, we've, we've given the tribute to the veterans. Um, it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing that the, the attitude toward and the system for in a capitalist democratic world can go through rhythms. Now, we go through rhythms. God knows there are days when you just feel on top of the world, and there are other days when you feel like the world is on top of you. That's just the rhythm of what is life is all about. And there are days when you can do it, and there are days when everybody else can do it, and you can't do it. Well, I, I've been looking back over some of the attitudes toward the military and the family. So glad, where did that guy mention support of the families? how important it is and how we would not be where we are without the military. And I told a little story before about my godfather who had been in the First World War and who uh, ended up um, getting Parkinson's disease. And as a child, I thought Parkinson's was a result of the war. It wasn't. But as a kid, he was the only one I knew who had it. Years later, when uh, another woman in our family friendship circle got Parkinson's. And I thought to myself, how did she get Parkinson's? She wasn't a veteran. She wasn't in the war because I had made that connection. Okay. Now I'm going to make another connection with veterans. I lived in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is a port city right opposite Manhattan. 
It's the first stop you get on in Elizabeth, you get on the train, and the first stop is New York City. Very easy for my father to compute to commute to his office. But during the First World War, so many of the men who entered the military, the impact of that was that the veterans' hospitals, which had been used for the Civil War and the War of 1812, were miles away from the port. Why? Because they never thought that there would be an international war. First World War was the first international war that America was involved in. So what happened when the men and came back wounded on the, on the troop ships, they landed at Elizabeth Port, the other places too, but that was one big port, but the hospital for the veterans was 62 miles from the port. So they put out a call, any, any woman who would like to learn how to drive vehicles that could be used, come and volunteer. And both of my aunts volunteered, and they were on call. They, had, they would get a call saying a ship is coming in. Now, they had learned how to drive cars they never drove before. They learned how to drive trucks hearses, back, uh, bakery trucks, you name it. Every vehicle that could was commandeered and they would be uh, brought, the, whoever owned the vehicle would bring it to the place and the women who were trained would drive the veterans to the hospital. And when the war was over, each woman who was in that group, and there were 25 in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and at one time I had the privilege of meeting a bunch of them besides my two aunts, and they ended up getting $500. Now, they had done this for the entire time of the war, you know, the, the United States was involved. So, both of my aunts went out and bought a car. One of them was a teacher in the public school system, and she bought the car, and every year she bought a new car. Every year, she turned in the year-old car and got the new one. Turned it in, got the new one, turned in. All she ever paid for was gas and change of oil. She never had a repair bill in her entire life. And she was a great keeper of track, a record of everything, okay? Whereas my other aunt, not being a teacher, working in the home, uh, managing, we used to call her the manager behind her back. She managed everything in the household because my mother was the heavy looker on her. My mother never saw a job as somebody else did. She couldn't look at it and say, oh, you did a lovely job. Okay, but my aunt, my aunt did the job. So she kept the car, and she took three cars in her driving career 100,000 miles. And the first car that she took 100,000 miles was when I was a little girl, and I really thought the thing was going to fall apart. At 100,000 miles, where would the, speedom, or the odometer go? Nine, 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 dot nine? <laughs> What's going to happen? I didn't know it could go back to zero. But anyway, I learned a lot. <laughs> so I give you those two stories in terms of the gratitude that I had growing up in a family that absolutely loved and cared for veterans. My sister married a Navy man, her son married a Navy man, and her grandson now has married a Navy man, I mean, is a Navy man, and he's now going, uh, is on shore duty in Seattle, and gets put on a helicopter or a plane or someplace to go and find submarines that have a problem. I mean, it's all in the family, so I'm grateful for that. So that's my introduction to Veterans Day, so that I didn't overlook it. I mean, I wouldn't want to be somebody that on the 11th day of the 11th month wasn't smart enough to say something good about how many people over time going back as far as the revolution all the way to today hasn't cared for the country. So I belong to that club and I thank you and I've never been in that kind of service, but sometimes I think being a married old sister is a little bit like being in the service, you know, it, it, it has certain qualifications. That's right. All right, so now why did I put these two things together? Gratitude and giving. Part of it is because, I don't know about you, but all of a sudden it's November. I mean, where did all the other months go? I find it hard to keep track of it in this climate. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I would need a good brisk autumn day to remember that Christmas is Thanksgiving and all that other November stuff is coming. Okay. So it kind of took me by surprise when November popped up on the calendar. Okay. But it's important that we understand the connection between 
the gratitude that we celebrate and and the kind of the professional uh, career of or day of Thanksgiving. And then what Christmas is, which is always a, a celebration of giving, God giving to us, us giving to each other. Now, I, I want to present this image, which hasn't been in any song. So this is my one contribution to your thought pattern. It is that, think of a coin. You can't spend all the heads of the coins in your pocket and left with the tails. Or you can't spend all the tails and left with the heads. Every coin you spend has to give out its head and tail. So I want to connect the gratitude we have and the giving which we do as part of the same transaction, part of the same system of economy. In other words, if you are grateful, you can give. And sometimes having to be grateful for things that are difficult can become easier when you start giving and you realize that you can compensate. And it truly is a compensation when you're able to give back into society. Um, I stop and think between uh, services today, I talked to one of the members here and we were talking about the, the role of uh, AA in the community and how, how crucial their logic is of what it means. If you are a member of that system and then you're advised, if you're not a member, you're advised to go to the parallel organization of Al-Anon, what you learn is if you are gifted, and it is a gift, if you are gifted with sobriety, your responsibility is to help someone else. Now, that's written into their code. I mean, sometimes I really think that, that God put alcohol, the creator put alcoholism into, into the community, not just alcoholism, but any addiction, so that the, the, the giving would keep on going. Because it really has to be somebody who understands who can help. If you don't understand what the addiction is, you can't help somebody else who's trying to get out of it. We can be beside it. We can hope that we understand. But the real understanding comes from the one who has gone through the hell of it. So I think, I think that in itself reinforces the connection between gratitude and giving. The gratitude that someone can understand this is something which could admit to a solution and then the giving to another who would also need help in that circumstance. So, you know, it's, it's, our society is very interesting how it teaches us. It teaches us by the things that happen to us along the way. Some of you know that I have just finished a four-year experience, and I don't, I don't want to call it an exercise. It was a real experience. There was a marital sister in my house who uh, fell in December of 2014 and cracked her pelvis, which is no fun. We now have a beautiful ramp in front of our house because she needed it to get back up into the house. And we managed to get the, the ramp put in before she got out of Straub and then rehab. And then the Sisters of St. Francis let her stay with them for seven weeks after that. So basically she was gone almost three months and we got the ramp in. Thank you. That was good. But the upshot of that all was that for the last four years, including a marvelous four-month trip back to New York in 2016, which was the last time she could travel, and I fought like a tiger to bring her back to Honolulu because her ministry was in Honolulu with people she had taught, people she had met, and her great spiritual transition which occurred in her life here, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But the real issue was she really was still working. In fact, she was working until the very last day that she died, two weeks ago Thursday, when she had not been able to swallow, not been able to really participate in the dinner, but who came to the dinner table fully dressed, fully clothed, very alert. And then after everybody had finished the dishes and put away everything, said, well, I think I'll, I'll go to my room. She went to her room. Somebody went by and said, do you need anything? No, I'm fine, says she. Takes off her habit, went off to the bathroom, came back to her chair. Now, the person who said, do you need anything, that was 10 minutes after 8, two weeks ago Thursday night. And at quarter to 9, that's 35 minutes, I came home from a, a meeting, and I put my hand on her head, and it was warm. So I thought she was asleep, kind of slumped over in the chair. Then I went around her 
her chair I had come in from her back. And I came went around, I sat down, and I looked at her, and I was like, uh-oh. She wa- I knew she wasn't breathing. And then I checked her pulse to make sure. No pulse. Nothing in the neck, nothing in the ankles, nothing in the wrist. So I sat down, got the telephone out, and I called Straub. I'm sorry, doctor does not take calls after hours. Please bring your patient to emergency. Well, thank you. I am smart enough not to bring a corpse to... I mean, the lady was dead. She was dead. And I needed to really have a little advice. So I called my doctor, my former student. I can get anything I want out of him. Uh, Cyril Goshima, in case you need a recommendation. But he's going to retire pretty soon. So what are these people retiring that I'm still working? But anyway, he's... (laughs) There's something wrong with that picture. But he ended up saying, don't do anything now. Just have someone lift her from the chair to the bed, lie her down, cover her up. That's it. In the morning, call emergency. I'm giving you that as a suggestion because even though I had in my hand a do not resuscitate, had I called them and it was not five hours from when she actually had expired, the wonderful EMT people, they have to do what they have to do. And they'd say, well, as long as it gives some kind of a blip on the machine, we have to respond. And I probably would have lost it, but I didn't even have to lose it because Cyril said, don't call until the morning. So we called in the morning and he signed the, officially signed the death certificate and that was it. But to have had a woman live so beautifully, so amazingly easy, such an amazingly easy death, literally within a half an hour, she probably choked a little bit and her heart wasn't able to take it. She'd already, and she'd already told the doctors, I don't need anything more. I'm fine. Thank you. I'm 95 years old. What do you want to do? Um, and she, I don't think the doctors liked it, but that's what she told all the doctors. She didn't want any histrionic methods. But I want to tell you the gift of being with her. I can stand here knowing I do not have a single regret for those four years. And I'm honored to be able to say that because I didn't do it. It was the creator that we just sang about and loved and said, I did it. I said, yes. In fact, they made a little deal with God. And I said, okay, you have to take care of me if I'm going to take care of her. It was, it was, that was a pretty easy uh, admission. And I said that. And then I said, and I meant it, after she goes to you, you can do whatever you want with me. <laughs> so you will now notice I have bound legs. I, am, I have given up, I've truly given up ever going to the New York Ballet again. I've had too many refusals. They will not accept me into their dance program. So, <laughs> Okay, so I have fat legs, what can I say? And then the other thing is I... I don't know this, but I have decided that whatever God wants to do with me now is part of that yes that I said. We sang about the yes. And the yes is important because, as well as knowing that when you sing, you pray twice, there's another wonderful prayer to that Sister Rosario learned in her path toward sanctity. And it is, for all that has been, thanks. For all that will be, yes. That is one of the earliest documented prayers in the earliest of the Christian liturgies, but it could also be probably in other traditions also. I think the Native Americans have a wonderful way of saying what the creator, as they, the word that they use for their creator, what the creator sends, accept. And Sister Rosario, in her 60s, had four separate cancer surgeries in over a two-year period, two breast reductions and two colon resections. And each time she said to four different doctors, just go in there and take it out, nothing more. Refused chemotherapy and refused radiation and lived to be 95 with no further malignancy. What can I say? I don't know. If I were a doctor, I'd probably be saying, go ahead and have chemotherapy, but... The real issue is we never know what God wants to do with us. And the one gift that she got during those four acceptances of saying yes to God, the one thing she got was the gift of praying 
instead of saying prayers. Now, there's a distinction. You can come in and say the prayers. Oh, my God, I believe that. And I mean, as a grown-up baby Catholic and now adult Catholic, now retired, or am I retired? Well, whatever. But the idea that people say prayers, and she never missed saying her office, divine office. She never missed saying the rosary. She never missed, she never missed, she never missed, until... There was that time when she really couldn't, when she was sick. And then she learned that the praying was the breathing and the acceptance and the saying yes and the whatever. And that made her, still she prayed, but she prayed, then she prayed as opposed to saying the prayer. So I offer you that as a little gift from her because uh, she really learned it. She truly learned it. And uh, we talked a lot about that late at night. She'd She'd want to talk when she... I used to stop by in her room. Anytime I got up at night, I would stop by her room. And if she was awake, I'd sit down and we'd have a little chat. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And I'm grateful. So I give you that as another part of this gift. Because she not only said thank you for the gift of illness that she'd had, but then she also gave that knowledge and that acceptance and a gift back to me. So I'm living out what I'm saying is the title of my sermon today because you can live it out also. Whatever it is that God has dumped in your lap, if you're smart enough to say to the creator, well, thank you, you probably think, God, why do I have to go through this of all things? You, you can use your dialogue with yourself, but don't use it with your creator. Say to the creator, okay, I know you're a part of this. I know you've given it me. It's a gift. And because it's a gift, I say thank you. And from that thank you, you're going to be able to give the rest of your life to other people in whatever way it happens. I don't know. I don't know each of you, but even in two people came up whom I don't know after the 9 o'clock service, and I didn't say the same thing. I never say the same thing twice, pretty much. I don't want to bore me, you know. Um, but seriously, two people came up and said, you know, I needed to hear that. Yeah, I like that. That's not me. That's God. That's what God is doing. And the healing that comes from this community, because you are accepted, you have come to this community, by all means, if you know anybody who needs to be accepted in a church community, bring them along on another Sunday. Because that's, that's how this community continues to grow. You need to know that you are the group that accepts, the group that includes. You don't say to somebody, well, what made you leave the church that you used to go to? <laughs> no, you don't say that to people. And you shouldn't ever think it either because that's the reason why unity has a place. And that's the reason why I'm always so glad when I have any reason to come. And as you know, I appear upon occasion and I'll appear on any occasion I get invited. It's up to you to invite me. I won't ask to come and say, I want to come. But I'm telling you, I love to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>